uh, where you take your first morsel of food, this is in that. These are all important occasions, and then you can get the blessing and barakah by mentioning the name of Allah So obviously writing a book, something as important as this, is going to start off um, with the Rasmana. So he says, أَمَّا بَعْدْ حَمْدَ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي هُوَ فَاتِحَةُ كُلُّ كِتَابٍ وَالصَّلَاةُ عَلَى رُسْلِهِ الَّذِي هَيَ خَاتِعُةُ كُلُّ خِطَابٍ فَإِنِّي أُنَبِّئُهُكَ عَلَى رَقْدَتِكَ أَيُّهَا الْمُسْتَرْسِرُ فِي تِلَاوَتَكَ أَنْ مُتَّخِذَ دِرَاسَةَ الْقُرْآنِ عَمَلًا الْمُتَلَقِّفُ مِمَعَانِيهِ ظَوَائِرَ وَجُمَلًا إذا كان تطوف على ساحل البحر مغ مصر عينيك أو مغ من عينيك عن ظرائبها أو ما كان لك أن تقوم متى نبتخها لتبصر عجابي بها So he's very clear who he's talking to at the beginning here So he's basically saying that a human was just the one who is spending much time in tilawa of the Qur'an, recitation, because tilawa means recitation. Mustasid means you are spending much time. Al-Muntafi Dirasat Al-Qur'an Amala, the one who has taken the study of the Qur'an as the thing that they do, it's their amal, it's what keeps them busy. So, so far, two good attributes. Who doesn't want to have much recitation of the Qur'an? Who doesn't want to have the Qur'an to be the thing that they're busy with? So he mentions those two things. المتلطف المعنيه ظواهر وجملة Right, the one who gets from its meaning ظواهر Things that are clear and manifest وجملة And compound meanings as well. Still good. Then he says something a little bit shocking. إذا كان تطوف على ساحل البحر مغملا عينيك عن ظوائبها How long Will you remain upon its shores, closing your eyes and not seeing its ghalaib, its more important aspects? So he, he starts out by praising the person who's reciting the Quran. Good, spend much time reciting the Quran, thinking about its meaning, maybe you're reading some of the tafasir and so forth. But then he says, How long are you going to do that without penetrating? what's more important, right? And he says here by Allah, in other words, the things that may be less known. Is it not for you to get on the boat? Right, because he's saying, if you're just reading the Quran from the outside, and you're reading the verses, you're on the shore, you're on the, the, the beach. How long are you going to stay there? Just being on the beach. Isn't it time for you to get on this, the ship, the boat, and go into its waters, go into the ocean, go into the sea of meaning that is the Qur'an? What to إِلَى جَزَائِبِهَا لِسْجِنَاءِ أَطْلَعَبِهَا Should you not travel now to its islands, right, within the sea that you can't see yet, and then you go pick from its fruit, from its tayyibat, from its good things. وَتَغُوصُ فِي عُمْدِهَا فَتَسْتَغْنِيَ بِنَيْنِ جَوَهِيهَا And should you not dive to its depths so that you can find uh, its jewels? So he's using very uh, uh, illustrative imagery, right? He's not saying literally, but he's saying figuratively. And he's, he, says, he mentions later on why he uses figurative language. In fact, why do you call it jewels of the Qur'an? Right, and we know that a jewel or a jawhara, right, uh, is something that is a precious stone. So it could be a ruby, it could be uh, 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 aquamarine, it could be, uh, well, you know, all the women they know the, the birth of stone jewels, for sure, right? Sapphire, you don't know, this side doesn't know any of that. <laughs> Only give you your wife's birth month, right? You know that one, sort of. When you look it up, when you have to look, we don't know anything about it. Anyway, we're pretending. So, he's mentioning it, he's making this tashbih, he's using this imagery, because what he wants to talk about here, right, is something that we don't have a language to talk about it. What I mean by that? Um, when we talk about things of divine essence, when we talk about in ma'arif of Wuhaniya, right, we talk about Adam and Zayb or Shahada, we talk about the world of the unseen and the world of the seen. And the world of the unseen, or the light, no one has seen it yet, except our Prophet Sallallahu 
but no other human being has really seen it, right? And when we see the description of these things, sometimes mentioned in the Quran and the Hadith, there's a lot of what we call tashbih. Right? The Quran says, Lahmitlayim yimma yashabun. Right? Lahmitlayim yimma yashabun. So we meet a bird that you would like. But it's not really like turkey or chicken or quail or anything that you find in this life. It's something quite different. However, how else could Allah SWT reference such things except in terms of that which is, we you know, from this life? There's no way to talk about it, right? And remember, the thing is better going to point out that some people have made a mistake when they read such things in the Qur'an that they interpret them literally, right? Because they don't get it that it's referring to something well beyond anything that we can have a level of comprehension for. And this is referred to in the Qur'an, especially about some of these verses, in ayat and mutashabihat. With ayat and muhtamat, right? So there's two types of verses. In mutashabihat, those are the verses that are mutashabih. In other words, there's tashbih, there's a similarity to things that are in the observed world. But the similarity ends with the language, the word being used. They're not really similar. And the same thing, Right, um, that you find some of the hadith. And then there's ayat muhtadat. Right, kunna umul kitab wa ukhalu mutashabihat. Fa amma ladina fi kulu bi huzaynu fa yattabi'una ma yatashabihat min tila'i fitnati wa tila'i ta'wili. Wa ma ya'alu ta'wilahu illa Allah. Wa ma sikuna fa yakuluna amanna bihi kulu bi amri rabbina. First, the three or four verses to the Quran. So there are ayat muhtadat, kunna umul kitab. They are literally the, the fountainhead or the mother of the book. These are the ones that are clear, manifest, you tell what they mean. But others are mutashabihat. Others, there's imagery used, there are words that will provoke your imagination, but they can't be like what you see in this world, right? So he's, the Qur'an is actually going back to a meaning that we just mentioned about the Mazali. So it's taking it back to the observer, to the one who's interpreting. So the one who has in his heart, Zayb, right? Uh, Marat, uh, and Hiraf, right? There's a type of uh, disease or there's a type of awijaz uh, or crookedness in their heart. Right? So they follow that which it seems to show a similarity to. And you can say this, that they interpret it literally, right? Uh, right? And in that, they fall into fitna. And they think they know its interpretation, but only Allah knows its true interpretation. Or only Allah, it's also a valid way of reading the verse. So only Allah knows what Rasikun, those who are well versed in knowledge, may know its interpretation. Right? But the minimum that you say, you say all of it is from Allah and we believe in it. So, some of the verses that seem to give Allah human like attributes. All of these things would be what the which means that. If it says yet, and yet in Arabic, literal meaning means either arm, like the whole arm, uh, sometimes people mean hand, but usually it means the whole arm. Like, right? Wash, not your hands, but your whole arm, which would be from the fingertips all the way up to including the elbows. That's the yet. So when it says, God's yet is above their yet. What does that mean? Right? And so those who are following just the literal meaning of it don't realize that it's an imagery there because you can't understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not from Adam, he's not from this world, he's not from any world that you can comprehend. So how can you apply that and say that he has a yet? Right? That he literally has a hand or literally has an arm or literally has a shin. Right? The day that the shin will be uh, unveiled. Or in the hadith, that the heart of the believer is between the two fingers Asabiyah of Rahman, between the two fingers of Rahman. Does he have two fingers? And the Quran also says, Bal yadah mabsutatan. 
right? When the people of the book said that uh, uh, that Allah is stingy in giving, and then the Quran you know repels this idea and says, but the Rather, both hands, both arms are outstretched in what he gives. Doesn't mean that he has two, but the other person he has one. Right? Does he have a face? Right? We are the one to look at the Jalal Everything will be destroyed except his countenance, like his face, so there's a lot of face. So these are ayat mutashabihat. Right? And as the member of Zali points out, there are some people who will read that and say, no, it has to be the literal meaning. It's hafiz, literal. Right? Allah has a face not like our face. He has a hand not like our hand. He has this not like us. So forth. And this is a problematic way of looking at it. Because only the true meaning can be known by Allah's final power, number one. And number two, it's describing something you have no comprehension of. So it can only use figurative imagery. Just like when it talks about things in paradise. It's figurative. Right? Right? They're sitting outstretched on this type of lounge chairs, if you will, by the way, I'll translate surah, right? Mutafabidin, looking upon one another, the people of paradise, and Allah make us men from them. But, how is that exactly? We don't know. What type of colors will there be in paradise? What will the ground feel like? How tall will we be? What will we look like? What will we eat? These are things that we find some descriptions within the Quran and the Hadith, but again, it's all things that we can't have a comprehension for. So, I remember what Zayn was trying to point out here is don't stop at the one and realize that there's something beyond just what it says, but beyond the edifice, that there are inner meanings in there, and that your ability to encounter these meanings and penetrate them is based upon the mirror of your heart. As we said, if that mirror is not polished, you're not going to say anything. Right? That's why many people go to the Quran, they don't get much out of it. Because they're coming and they're, they're deceased. But if they're coming and they're purified, right? One of the things like the spiritual exercises that we're asked to do every year, fasting of Allah. Right? We fast all day from Fajr to eleven. What do we do at night? Huh? After we eat a lot. The Quran, right? These are the nights of the Quran. And there's a direct relationship between fasting and Quran. And you might say, what's that? How is the relationship? Fasting is the process of purification, what we call tahriya. Tahriya means emptying you of vice. And uh, it was uh, the Prophet said it was said itself that Adam, that the sons and daughters of Adam have not filled the vessel more corrupt or more putrid than their stomachs. And people don't realize that one of the major keys to having a more uh, felicitous spiritual life is their stomach. We just assume that you know I can eat whatever I want, how I want, so forth, and you know I stay away from pork, I don't drink, I lost everything else is set. But not quite, right? If the Quran instructs the prophets in the Quran, uh, so he, he puts the connection between eat from that which is pure and do and do good deeds. So there's a connection between the two. Right? So when they say you are what you eat, literally you are what you eat. But it's not just what you eat, it's not just you know um, the actual thing that you eat, but how did you procure that thing that you eat? Where did it come from? You, when you spent money to buy it, where did your money come from? Is it from halal or is it from halal? Right? When the Prophet says about the person, uh, is Mecca in halal, Matam in halal, and Mashram in halal, and Mabas in halal, Fa'ana is to Jabala. Right? Everything about him is halal. Where he got his clothes, what he eats. I'm not, it doesn't mean that he's eating pork or something halal like that, but the way by he was procured them from illicit eating. Then he says, How is Allah going to answer his du'a? So one of the keys to answering du'a is that you make sure that your source of sustenance is from halal, not from halal. Right? And so people question the idea, how come you know, I feel down, how come I feel depressed, how come I feel like 
engaged, out of contact. Look to your life. What are you doing? Right? If you, if you find that your sources of income and things like this are dubious, right? Or there's question marks around it, this is going to affect you. It's going to affect your inner life, for sure. Not only that, where does the food come from? Where are you getting it? The people who prepared it, who are they? Who are the people who prepared your food? We think it's just, you know, it's okay. Whoever prepares it doesn't matter. But that has an effect, right? Uh, that kid who's flipping burgers for minimum wage at McDonald's, right, and that's like what you eat every day. I'm not even talking about the whole McDonald's, the Bihana, the I'm not talking about that issue. But that kid is doing that. How happy is he with his life when he's flipping those burgers, right, doing it for minimum wage? And he's preparing your food, and that's where you're getting your food from. Compared to someone who prepares your food, and they're doing it with love. They're doing it with honor. They're doing it because they want to please God, right? And they want to prepare something for you. They see it as an event. I don't like I eat both types. It could be still a hamburger. But when they're prepared by someone who has these meanings in their heart, what a difference between the two. Right? So the way that you procure your food, the way that you get it, People are not aware of it today, but what we eat today is not food. It's food products. The food that we eat, you know, uh, sorry to say the potato chips that we all just had, that's a food product, it's not food. It was designed in a lab by someone called a food scientist. Uh, if anyone's a food scientist, I don't think they are, but just, just tell them like it is. Uh, just like when I talk about the campus. Just tell me like it is. So food scientist, uh, they make this up and they put uh, ingredients in there so that it can be addictive. So that you can't just have just one. You think that Pringles ad was just an ad? No, they actually designed it that way. Right? So that you want more of it. And it has very, very little nutritional value. It doesn't add anything to your diet. Read the back. Read the label on the back. See what percentage of anything of the things that you need during the day is there. And it'll be a lot of zeros. Except for carbohydrates. Right? And if this is your staple diet, not just saying about the detriment on your health, that's another situation. I'm talking about the detriment on your inner life, right? Who do we to tell you that? Eat that which is tiny, eat that which is good, eat that which is pure. The way that it's procured, right? If the farmers who produce the potatoes where you get the potatoes from, they're being uh, manipulated, right? And they're working for minimum wage. And, and uh, you know, or, or the strawberry pickers in Mexico working for minimum wage and you eat those strawberries and they have barely nothing to survive by and you're benefiting from this, right? We're all quite happy with the clothing sale that we go to at the department store when we can get, you know, 50 and 60 percent off when we pay like what seems to be next to nothing. Go look at the label on the back of the clothes. If it says made in Bangladesh or made in Vietnam or made in China, what do you think those people got for it? What do you think the conditions are that they're living in? So as Muslims, it's not just we should be ethical people, but realize that these things will affect your life, right? And if you're aware of them, you're cognizant of these meanings, and you seek to live your life in the most pure fashion, of the deeper Allah will reward you for it, and He will give you things that you couldn't imagine. Um, but we get often caught up in just the status quo of things that are where people are doing things we don't realize uh, many of these meanings behind it. So I'm not telling anybody just stop shopping at the supermarket, stop shopping at the department store, do all these things. This is going to be according to your level of awareness and conviction. And everybody's going to be different. From a strictly halal halal aspect, we're not, we're not talking about that. But we're talking about if you're looking to see and unlock greater meanings in your life, perhaps start with look what you do first. You know, what, what enters into you, what enters into the body, because it does have an effect on you. So back to Wayne Mazzani, uh, so he's kind of uh, repudiating the person who's just reading the Quran and deciding and doing his presentation, and they never stop to think more deeply uh, and penetrate its inner meanings. Right? So then he says, uh, أو ما بلغك أن القرآن هو البحر المحيط ومنه يتشعب علم الأولين والآخرين كما يتشعب عن سواحل البحر المحيط عن هوا وجدها وانها. He said, isn't it time for you that you should kind of look to yourself and stop depriving yourself from its jewels, from its pearls, right? By just only looking at the shores, the سواحل, only looking at the coast. You're not going into the ocean. 
Don't you know, or have you not heard, that the Qur'an or Bahr al-Muhit, that the Qur'an is the deep sea, deep ocean. And from it comes the knowledge of all those who came before and all those who come after. Just like from the sea or the ocean comes out rivers and lakes and other things. So he is saying directly that the Quran is a source of knowledge of all things. In other words, the true knowledge in al right? Later on he's going to talk about al Tajiri. Tajiri means experimental knowledge or empirical knowledge that we get by experimentation, which is a valid source of knowledge. So he's not talking about this per se. But he's talking about all knowledge of the deen, every single thing, all of the, the disciplines that we talk about, whether it's fiqh, whether it's tafsir, whether it's hadith, whether it's any of those things, their original source will be found in the Qur'an. And in fact, there's a very profound chapter that I hope we're going to read some parts of this day that talks about how these things came out of the Qur'an, right? How are they the source, how the source ultimately is the Qur'an. So, he then goes on to say that um, there are people who did this, right, and they, they went to the depths uh, of the Qur'an and they went to its various islands and they picked up all of these qadidat, right, they picked up all of these fruits and all of these understandings. And while the Zayn doesn't say it himself, you can understand, you can glean from his words that he is someone who has done this, right. This is another reason we read a person like the Zayn because it's not just theoretical academic knowledge he's talking about here. There are certain things that you can learn only via your own experience, right? And sometimes when other people share that experience with you, it could be a key to unlocking your own experience, right? So what many of them refer to as, you know, tahqiq. Uh, we talked with people who attended the, the session last night at the tea house. We talked a little bit about how you have to have your own personal convictions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about your iman, right? And people will vary in the way and the route that they go about doing that and what they gain from it, but some people will go very deep. And Allah will show them things, will show them signs, right, that maybe He didn't show to others. Allah will specify His rahmah for whom He pleases. So this is not beyond the kudra ilahi, it's not beyond the divine omnipotence, the divine power that anyone can be given everything by Allah, right? And there's no kind of prerequisite per se, right? You should never say to yourself, how can that person know anything? They, uh, they don't have a beard. They, uh, you know, I see them wear shorts sometimes. Uh, they don't always pray the message. Uh, they have a fancy car. You know, we have to stop being judgmental. We're very, very judgmental. Uh, this is my observation. Uh, especially in the times we live in now, it's like an international thing. We're very good about other people's being and make all of these assumptions about who they are, what they know, and so forth, based upon the law here. Right? And one of the things that we know is that the awliya of God, the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who have a special relationship with Allah, generally speaking, they are hidden. You don't know who they are. Right? And it doesn't have to be the big sham with the big beard and the big turban. That's not an indication that someone is having a special relationship with Allah. I've met in my life people, you would never think that they have that. But you with them and you feel something different. They change you from the inside and they don't even say a word. Just being in their presence, right? These are special people. And they could be a shopkeeper. They could be someone you didn't <clears throat> think anything of, right? Those people, if you've ever been to uh, Medina, and Allah gives you the, the, uh, the, the, the blessing to be there, You'll find that there are certain people who, who are employed there and they, they clean the masjid, they clean the Medina Mosque. And I've watched those people up close and I see them, and many of them I feel like they do it because they love it. Right? Usually people think, oh, clean the masjid. And you hardly find, to be honest with you, you hardly find any Saudis or Arabs doing that job. I didn't see one. All of them usually come from the India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Most of Bangladesh, I think. And uh, they do it with shaba, with love, with mahabba, right? Because they understand the meaning of being a person who is cleaning a place that is affiliated with the Prophet, Allah right? And people don't think of anything with people like that. They think that it's just 
He's, you know, he's a maintenance man, he's a custodian, he's just cleaning the place up. But you'll find it in places you didn't imagine. So don't ever think that because someone, someone looks a particular way or behaves a particular way or doesn't behave in a way that you expect that somehow you're superior, that you're better. One of the signs that you are of these people is that you don't think anyone is better than think you're better than anyone else. Right? The moment you start thinking you're better than other people because of your being, know for sure you're not. You're definitely not. Right? Because if that feeling enters into you, then that's a clear indication that you're not. If you say to yourself, uh, I'm a very humble person, then you're not humble. Right? Because the humble person doesn't acknowledge that you're humble. Because humility is defined as being not seeing yourself. Right? You don't have a rookie as that idea. You don't see yourself. But when you start seeing yourself, I'm humble, I am good, I am mushtahid, I am sadi, I am uh, striving, I am obeying Allah, I am doing these things. So if you ever start off the thought in your head with the word I, then you are not those things. Because the word I to begin with doesn't enter into the equation. Who is the first one to use the word I? Anna? Shaitan. Shaitan was the first one to say Anna. Of created beings. Anna. Anna khayyum bin. And what are the next two words out of his mouth? Khayyum bin. I am better than him. So it's a satanic thought to begin with, right? To say, I am better. And you may say, no, I don't say that, but you think it. Because when I say you're saying that, you think it. Right? If you think it, if you live it like that, that you are better, then you're not better. Right? Because the divine perspective, past, present, and future, are meaningless. Right? Isn't that what we know? That past, present, and future from Allah's perspective doesn't mean anything. How things end. In other words, Allah knows the eventual Masih. He knows the eventual place you're going to be at. So while you may be uh, looking down and ridiculing someone in front of you because of the way they look now, you don't know how they're going to end up. And you don't know how you're going to end up. Right? So every single person out there potentially is a dweller of paradise and you don't know that every single person even Donald Trump I don't know his is that could be much better than anyone in this room we have no idea we have no idea about that so that means that our relationship with people and how we deal with them will be based upon the potential they may have at the very minimum at the very least they're human beings they're creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Right? And what someone is doing right now this second doesn't define them. It doesn't mean that they're always going to be like that. It doesn't mean that's who they are. Who they are is they're a servant and slave of Allah. And they always have the potential to make that realization on their own. Right? And then come back to it. So who are we? Who are we to say, well, that's impossible. That can't happen. This person is destined to hell. Who are we to say that? Right? This is like the end of this is like you taking upon God-like properties for yourself. And that is the worst type of sin. When you start acting like that, like you're the one who has people's uh, uh, place and where they're going to be and how they're going to be, and as if you can dictate that, and as if you can make those calls. That's not for us, for us to worry about, right? There's no benefit in saying, we don't have, there's no type of victory in Islam where we say, la ilaha you can't take your sifha and say, Lana Allah Shaitan, Lana Allah Shaitan, Lana Allah Shaitan. Not of the Prophet, not of any of the companions, not of anyone after that. It's been out. But, praise be Allah. So Allah Ta'ala is our Islam. These are the things that will change you, that will get to your heart. So, our way to Allah Ta'ala is not based upon hatred. Abedin. It's not based upon hatred, it's based upon love. And the reason that we repudiate the things that Allah repudiates, Right? We reject the things that Allah rejects. It's not because we have an inherent hatred for them, but we love what Allah loves. And we reject what Allah rejects. And that is based upon love of Allah. It's not based upon hatred of a bad thing. Right? And even in the Quran, the Quranic language, Allah doesn't say about something that He hates this thing. In Allah, Allah He doesn't love them, but it doesn't say, يَحْرَهُ doesn't say that He hates them. Right? But he just negates the idea that Allah can be pleased with those particular acts. So, um, everyone has the potential to have any of these meanings come to them. And you may understand that even without realizing that. It could just come like that. Some people can have that 
realization. There was a very, very famous um, ascetic or scholar who lived in Iraq, who was in Mustafi, and he was a thief. He used to steal from people. He actually go in homes and rob them, right? So one time he's going up the ladder, uh, like a trellis or something, to get to the house and get to the open window on the second floor. And he's climbing up, and he's going to do his usual routine, you know, get in there, sort of just sleep, or steal something, eat. Um, and then he heard a voice somewhere that says, the verse of the Quran, uh, Is it not time for those who have wronged themselves that their hearts should now be prepared, right, and should turn towards the remembrance of Allah? That was it. Just right then and there. A complete realization that his whole life was wrong. Everything was wrong. And then he said to himself, Bella, yes, it is the time for that. Now is the time for that. And he descended the ladder, right, and he became one of the most well-known, pious people of his time. Such as here we are a thousand years later, and we're still talking about him. A person who was a thief, right, who stole from people. Go to something even closer than this. Sayyidina Umar al Khattab, what was he before he became Muslim? What was he going to do when he went to the house of Allah al Khattab in Iraq and he was intending to do what? He wanted to assassinate the Prophet. That was his intention. He wanted to kill him. Right? But nowadays, what do we say about Allah? We say, Radiallahu anhu. And where is he buried? Next to the Prophet. Can you imagine another religion in the world, another type of group like this where we can say that uh, the would-be assassin of the Prophet is buried next to him and is mentioned in the top three or four people of the closest companions to him. What other tradition is there that has that? Even the people who were the staunchest enemies and personally hurt the Prophet hindered into Arjuna, right, and ordered the execution, assassination of Sayyidina Hamza and ate from his, you know, still uh, uh, you know, bleeding liver on the battlefield. What do we say about her? Allah the Allah. May Allah be pleased with her. Right? And the Prophet has accepted her Islam. Wa Hasmat Islam and yeah, her Islam was good. And she's amongst the companions. In other words, she's amongst the closest and most pious people I've ever lived. Even though at that particular time, that's what she was. So don't judge people. We are not to judge. Don't be judgmental. Don't think that it's not possible that this person could possibly know something or be better or anything like that than you because of the way they look, right? And the particular impression that they leave with you, you have no idea, you don't know. And so we surrender, that which should be surrendered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the inner states, what's going on inside people, we don't know that. That's why all of the ahkam al all of the rulings that deal with transactions between people or even criminal punishment, it's based upon the line. It's based upon dispensable things. That's why you can prove, you need witnesses. It's not based on what's going on inside, because we don't know. So, when you get to something like takfir, calling another person a kafir or not a Muslim, very, 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 very hard to do. You need to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that that person is like that. There's a million reasons why that you wouldn't. And it was the principle of the Quda, of the Islamic judges, that they'd rather let a thousand people who may have been guilty go free, then to wrongly convict one person who was innocent. That was the principle. Right? And the Prophet said, if a hudud uh, right? Repel the hudud, repel the enactment, the execution of criminal punishment on people, the shuhuhad, by finding legal loopholes. That's what shuhuhad means in this context, legal loophole. Find a way for them out of it. Don't try to apply it. Right? This was the mercy of our people before us. One of the, the great uh, Tabi'in, Abu Sayyid ibn Musayyid, someone came to him and said, you know, we have this, uh, there's a drunk person outside. You know, he's kind of drunk, he's walking around. Should we go take him and report him to the Sultan? Right? So they can be punished. What did he say to him? He said, yeah, let's do that. You know, make sure he gets what's coming to him. He didn't say that to him. He said, take him into your house and cover him. So, the soul, cover him. Why do you want to make fatiha? Why do you want to humiliate him? Why do you want to subject him to do that? The soul, cover him, right? And wait for him. He made a mistake. He's still your brother. 
Allah, right? Ahu is your brother. Why do you want to do that to him? What is this thing that we have about ourselves that we want to embarrass, humiliate, you know, rip people apart, take them down? That's not the, that's not Islam. That's not the tradition. Cover him. You know, he made this mistake. You don't have to expose him. There's nothing in the deen that says you have to go and surrender him and yeah, put him to the authorities. Let him cover his mistake. Maybe he'll repent. Maybe he'll do this. Maybe he'll do that. That was the understanding of the Salaf. So you want to say, you're a Salaf. Right? He was from the righteous predecessors. That's how they understood the deen. That's how they dealt with people. They weren't judges. They didn't judge people. They were du'at. They invited people. Right? And we're not inviting to a snare. We're inviting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what the Quran says. Invite. With wisdom. And the beautiful invitation or the beautiful admonition. Right? The good one, the beautiful one, the good word. That's how you invite people. They said the shidda. Right? That was. With, with severity and austerity, right? And that's so that you can say, Allah, I have proven to him, now he's a kafir. If I said that, and Allah said, I'm going to Allah, he didn't accept, I'm a kafir. Who are you? Who are you to say that? That he's a kafir. How would you know that? Then the kuf, min awa min al Kuf is an act of the heart. It's not an act of the limbs, right? Some of them even said that if you see someone posturing before an idol, that doesn't mean he's a kafir. Maybe he's prostrate to the Qibla and he didn't see the statue. Right? You find a million excuses for them before you say, oh, this is Kofu. He did something that makes him a kafir. How about that? You find all of the dead we left. You find as many interpretations that will get him out of that problem as you can that is reasonable. That's how they treat you people. This whole thing that people are doing now, this is and this crazy, that's not anything on the it has nothing to do with Islam also. Don't think for a moment that they have anything of hot, that they have anything of truth. These are diseased people with diseased hearts, and they are being driven by disease. The whole thing is disease. The whole thing is manipulation and disease. There's nothing about it that's pure. There's nothing about it that's Islam. So, okay, we've got a little bit of tangent. So go back to remember the Zen. So basically this introduction is telling us go beyond the Vahir, go beyond the bricks and the edifice in front of the house, go inside, go beyond the shore, jump in the ocean, don't be afraid, right? But be prepared that when you do, right, that you have your gear, right? And this is what this whole book is about. You know, if you're gonna go to the deep depths of the ocean. Uh, you need to have your scuba gear, you need to have your oxygen tank, you need to be well prepared before you go into it. But he said, if someone is seeking that, then realize that the Quran is just so much more than what people think it is. It's so much more than this mere recitation, right? And, um, you know, one of the signs uh, that is mentioned, I believe, by Ibn Masrud of the day of judgment is that in the early period, there was uh, the Quran were few and the fuqaha were many. So the early period they would differentiate between a qari or faqi. And a qari would be someone who is a mere reciter of Quran or hamid of Quran, someone who could transmit it, but didn't necessarily understand what's in it or the meanings. And the faqi, right, the faqi who used that word now to mean someone who knows fifth of those students, but back then it meant someone who knows the meanings, right, someone who's, who's captured some of the meanings of the Quran. So he said in the early period, there were few people who were really just Qurra. And they were mostly Qurra. Later on, there was becoming a time when it would be mostly Qurra and very few Qurra. Right? There would be mostly people who could recite very well. And in fact, it's quite the industry now, isn't it? Right? That upon it, if he has a nice voice, a melodious voice, he has his tapes and now it's CDs or MP3s or whatever it is. And when you know, people listen to that, and it's become kind of this big business uh, of qira, of recitation of the Qur'an. But where is the dedication? Where is the time spent to thinking about the meanings of the Qur'an? The Qur'an is not a book to put on your shelf and then you take it down in a Ramadan, maybe, 
or just to recite without tadabbur. After that, if the Quran, do they not contemplate the Quran? Right? It's tadabbur, get to the bottom, get to the meaning. Right? And, and dubra shaykh is its back, it's what's behind the front. So the word tadabbur means that you're getting to something not just what you see on the outside, but get involved, get deep into the meanings. And of course, the fact. The key to that is to know. The key to that is its recitation. But as the Zen is saying here, do not stop at the recitation. Go beyond the recitation. Go and delve into it much deeper. Make the Quran, right? As Dua says, make it the spring of your heart, right? And make it that thing which removes hem, which removes worry, anxiety, and sadness. Then you penetrate it into something more of the deeper meanings of the heart, where you have that relationship. Um, with the Quran. So then he goes on to say, Sibr al-Qur'an wa al-Babu al-Aqsa wa ma'asadahu al-Aqsa da'wat al-Hibadi ila al-Jabbari al-A'la Rabbi al-Akhir wa al-Ula khalat al-Samawati al-Ula wa al-Aladim al-Sufla وما بينهما وما تحت الثرى فلذلك الحصر سورة القرآن وآياته في ستة أنواع. So here's going to talk about from his perspective how he sees the Quran is organized or how he sees the verses of the Quran are organized. And he said there are going to be six types, right? And this is the secret in it. Um, so he says ثلاثة منها السوابق والأصول المهمة وثلاثة الضوابط والتوابع المهمية المتمة. أما ثلاثة مهمة فهي تعريف المدعو إليه وتعريف الصراط المستقيم الذي تجد ملازمته في السلوك إليه وتعريف الحالي عن الوصول إليه. So he said these six types there are three that are kind of foundational and are kind of the basis of everything and then the other three types are متأملات or things that follow the foundational three but are used to complete all of the meanings. So what are the three that are foundational? He says um, first, he said, knowing and medru ilayhi. And we said, ta'wa, idru ila sabi rabbika. Medru ilayhi means whom? The one you are inviting to, who is Allah. So it's actually telling you that one of the foundational concepts in the verses of the Quran is so that you may know God, that you may know Allah's final power. That's the first one. وَتَعْرِيفُ السِّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِينِ The second one, knowing a sirat al-mustaqeen. Knowing that path to al-madr ilayhi. Knowing how to go to the one that you're calling to, you're being called to, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he tells you, وَلَزَمَتُهُ فِي السُّرُوبِ إِلَيْهِ Right? The one that is incumbent upon you to be firm in so that you may arrive to him. A sirat al-mustaqeen. وَتَعْرِيفُ الْحَالِ عَنْ الْمُسْلُونِ إِلَيْهِ Right? And then the third one he said, the state that you're going to, you'll be in when you arrive to him. So these are the three foundational types of verses in the Quran. The first, verses about Allah and his attributes and so forth. The second, um, verses about the Sirat al Mustaqim, what is the straight path, and how we can get to it, right? And that it's important for us to, to use it to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the third, Hal. What is the state once you get there, or you're on your way to there? What is it like? What is the description of that? Those are the three foundations. But rather the three that are completing this meaning, that are following the foundations, because we said six, what are the next three? فَأَحَدُهَا تَعْرِيفُ أَحْوَالِ الْمُحِبِّينَ لِلْدَعْوَةِ وَلَطَلَعِ سَوْحِ اللَّهِ فِيهِمْ وَسِدْرُهُ وَمَقْصُودُهُ uh, so the first one is knowing the states of those uh, who are lovers of the da'wah, lovers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said about them, they have prepared for them. So we find verses talking about the mutaqeen, right, or al-muhsineen, and so forth. This is the type of verses he's talking about. What, is, what do they look like? Who are those people? What are their attributes? That's the first one. And then the second one, 
فكانت احوال الجاهدين وكشف فضائلهم وجاهدهم بمجادلته وتحاجته على الحق. And then the second one is the opposite. Knowing the people who are the opposite of that, and their stories, the ones who defy the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ones who won't get one against his will, the ones that describe what happened, what was the thing that happened to him afterwards. People like Pharaoh, people like Qawm Al, uh, Qawm Lut, and all of these stories that are in the Quran, this is describing the ones who deny God, right? And the, and the consequences, the repercussions of doing so. So that's the second type. Then the third type, تعريف حوارات بين الناس بالطريق وكيفية أخذ الزاد والأهبة والاستعداد. So he said the last one of those three. تعريف حوارات بين الناس بالطريق وكيفية أخذ الزاد. So if the صراط المستقيم is a path, right? Then how do we know we're on that path? And what do we need to do to get upon it? And what are some of the milestones, right? He says بين الناس بالطريق. How do we establish the different stages we will stop at on the way to Rasul in Allah, on our way to God? Right? And how do we take our provision? The Zad and provision. What provisions do we bring with us on this very spiritual journey? So those are the six types, right? Three are foundational and three are fara'i, or three that are uh, of the three foundational ones. So in the next section he describes them a little bit. So we'll just pick out some things here and there. So he says that this is what this is talking about a law. تعريف المدعو إيه هو شرح معرفة الله تعالى وذلك هو كبير الأحوال تشتغل من هذه المعرفة على معرفة ذات الحق ومعرفة الصفات والأفعال. So when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how do we know him? Right? Because he's unlike anything that we know. He's, he doesn't resemble anything. He's completely different. So the general way that we go about knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is via three main things. So the first, which is the hardest, ma'arifat is that, and ha, knowing the divine essence. We'll get to the last part. And knowing the divine attributes. And then the third one, know the divine acts. And this is how we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's kind of what we call maratib. Uh, so other scholars have mentioned it this way. They say that maratib is tawheed, or the levels of tawheed that you internalize. Right? It's not the same that you have in Allah, but how do you internalize that? So there's something called Tawheed and Af'al. In other words, the oneness or the Tawheed of the Divine Acts. Namely, to know that every single thing that happens in the universe is a Divine Act. And that no matter if it seems to be coming from a human being, or it comes from an animal, or it comes from what we call natural phenomena, so whether it's the Earth going around the Sun, or the Moon going around the Earth, or uh, the person who you're driving on a highway with and he cuts you off at the exit, all of that is still a divine act. This is called Tawheed al afaal right? And when you internalize that, that's a makkala. That's one of the stations on the way, right? When you realize that, that wait a minute, all of this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing outside his will. There's nothing that he didn't do, that he didn't enact. That's one level. The level after that, Tawheed is sifat you realize that these acts go back to attributes, right? And it's not just the act, but they can, all of these acts can point to a particular aspect or attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what we call a sifa. Sometimes we use the word ism, right? Name of God or attribute of God, they're very closely related. They go back to one of these things. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala huwa al He is the one who gives sustenance to everybody. That means the manifestation of the tazib, of Allah giving sustenance, comes down in the form of divine acts. Right? So when you see someone, for example, uh, they just bought a, a nice new car, right? And then your neighbor, and you're like, well, I don't have a nice car like that, but they have a nice car. But then remember, tell he is that, wait a minute, Allah wa wasab. And if Allah is a wasab, and he is the one who gives sustenance, then that's the thing from Allah. So it's a divine act, 
that, that guy purchased a new car in the neighborhood, but it's going to have nothing to do with him. It's actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave that to him. Right? And I see that's a sign that points to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Subhanahu wa ta'ala, that even he gives the person who denies his existence, the person who can deny his existence, Allah will still give him his risk. Nonetheless, is there something more merciful than that? And then you say, wait a minute, that's mercy too. That person denies Allah, he's an atheist, he's, uh, he's the head of the atheist uh, Facebook group. I've seen his post. But he has a new Mercedes, and he has a new house, and he's having a uh, roast turkey for dinner tonight. He has all this list. But nevertheless, he denies Allah, but Allah still gives him. He still gives him sustenance. That's fahla. Or maybe it's his Tidraj, right? Maybe Allah is just keeping him this way and he'll take him to task and day of judgment. I don't know. But then you start seeing everything, not just the acts, but you see the divine attributes, right? Manifested before you in every single thing that you see. That's a higher level of Tawheed. The highest level, which I will not go too much into, because some even say that you can't even reach it. It's impossible. While others say, very few select people may be able to reach it, which is Tawheed as that, the realization of the divine essence. And that is predicated on the idea that, wait a minute, these attributes, they're actually kind of mental constructs for me to understand the essence. But it's only one essence. It's only one Allah. Right? So whether he's al Khalid, whether he's al Ghazal, whether he is al Murid, whether he is a Nafa, whether he is a Da, whether he is a Zahir, whether he is a Batin, an Awul, an Athir, all of these names and attributes point back to the one Allah, to the one essence. So that means that uh, I use those attributes to understand him, but it's only him, it's only Allah, there's nothing else. And that everything else that happens in the Kaul, everything that happens in creation is a manifestation because Allah exists. And if there was no Allah, there would be nothing. So the true existence, and the only existence really, is for the divine essence, is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of this is completely contingent upon that. No one would take the next breath, no one would do anything in this life, or in the next, without the will, power, and the divine essence being present. Right? And we can say these things intellectually, but when you live it, right, when it's penetrating your heart and your thoughts, and all of your engagements in life every day, you know, continuously, you'll be a different person. You will see the world quite differently, right? And you won't just, you won't see, you know, suffering, and you won't see evil, and you will see the manifestations of the divine essence that is all Allah. When the Quran says, Kulu shayin hadikun illa wajhah, right? Everything is hadik, everything is. And again, just like we say, inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajiru, this is mutha'i in Arabic, rajia. It means it's already happening, not it's going to happen. So when you say, kulu shayin hadikun, as the Quran says, illa wajhah, everything is destroyed. In other words, it's already destroyed. In other words, it doesn't already exist. It's not really there. Illa wajha, except for the divine essence. Nothing else can be seen, not even the attributes. When you get to that highest level of Tawheed, you don't even see attributes anymore. You just see Allah. That's all you see. So this is Ma'rifat is that. This is knowing Allah SWT in the highest way that you can know. And when we talk about knowledge of Allah, it's actually limitless. There's no limit to how much you can know about Allah. Why? Because if Allah SWT, هو المعروف or هو المعروف, if He is the object of knowledge, and Allah is infinite, he cannot be finite, he cannot put limits upon him. That means by knowledge of him, I can't put limits on that either. So that means, in as much as I think I know, I can always know more. I can always, no matter how much you think you know, you can always know more because Allah is infinite. So uh, we'll take a break here, we'll stop, and then for the uh, last session, uh, we'll come back after us. Alhamdulillah.